Welcome to the Big Bets on Campus podcast brought to you by BetMGM. I'm Mike Calabrese, joined by our college basketball expert, Tanner McGrath. And before we break down every matchup in the round of 64, we have to start with the play-in games here in Dayton. So we're going to get to the four that are on Tuesday and Wednesday with plays on sides in all four of those matchups. Tanner, I'll kick it to you first for Howard versus Wagner. Yeah, let's talk through it. It's great to see you, Breeze. Great to be back on the Big Bets on Campus podcast. And uh, this is a great game to start off the first four because this is a this is a wild matchup for a variety of reasons. Um, the big thing is you're getting two defenses that run plenty of matchup zone looks and press like crazy. And that feels like a staple defensive strategy about the, the MIAC and the Northeast Conference. So you're getting two offenses that are similar with the defenses, but... I don't know how they match up. Um, starting with Howard, I I thought at first, like looking at uh, you know on the uh, surface, I thought Howard would have a huge advantage because the Bison's Princeton motion offense has produced an immeasurable amount of open jumpers. I mean, they led the MIAC in three point rate and open three rate, both by a mile, and they canned thirty eight percent of their triples in conference play. So at first, I was like, you know what, Howard is just going to shoot right over the top of Wagner. But somewhat surprisingly, uh, Wagner is top 40 nationally in open three rate allowed. They close down on every jumper. And they are a much better ball handling team between the two, which is key against two press heavy styles. And uh, both teams are great at rebounding on both ends. So while both teams crash the uh, offensive glass pretty hard, I'm not sure if either has the advantage there. Wagner, however, fouls a lot less. They actually don't foul much at all considering their aggressive style, which will be really key against Howard because the Bison typically live at the line. Now, the Seahawks, they can't score to save their life, and their stats against press and zone defenses are predictably poor. But they enjoy a monstrous size advantage on the wing. Um, Melvin Consul Jr. will have probably two inches on Marcus Dockery. Uh, Tyron Allen will have maybe an inch on Bryce Harris. And those are the Seahawks' primary offensive creators. And the Wagner gets out in transition at a surprisingly high rate for a slower-paced team. Uh, They were fourth in the NEC in fast break points per game with 11, above the 70th percentile in transition frequency. And that could be the difference against a Howard team that ranks sub 350th nationally in fast break points per game allowed, sub 300th nationally in transition points per possession allowed, just over 1.1. They allowed like the 15th most transition possessions per game of any team, and they weren't great at stopping anything. So I think that this could be a rock fight, Um, you know, uh, Wagner can't score, and they actually match up defensively pretty well with um, Howard's perimeter-based offense. And, you know, as many of these 16 versus 16 playing games are, they usually are ugly, right? So I'm happy to grab over a possession in a points at a premium battle. I think Wagner's sitting about plus three and a half in the market with a Seahawks team that has some really interesting advantages, namely wing scoring, transition scoring, and excellent three-point defense. My biggest worry is that the ageless wonder that is Seth Towns um, just creates endlessly in the high post while cutting and slashing through Wagner's zone. But I'm willing to take my chances because he actually didn't shoot that well from the interior this year. wasn't super efficient. And one final point, if either of these teams played Purdue, I would love that matchup because you can zone Edie and then press the backcourt. But either probably gets blown out by North Carolina's supernova backcourt. So I will take Wagner here and then probably fade them in the next round. So just for the audience, give a little background on Seth Towns, uh, a primer on just how old he is. Oh, uh, where where do you even start? I mean, uh. <laughs> I believe he was recruited when Barack Obama was in the White House. Let's start there. Yeah, he, he played at Harvard in 2017, 2018. And then I believe he got hurt or stepped out away from college basketball until 2021, where he transferred to Ohio State. And then he stepped away again and then came back to Howard. So he is now, God, how how old is he? I think 25 or 26. 26. He's 26. He was born in November of of 1997. So he will be 27 this year. And he is still playing college basketball after all this time. And, you know, he he led some pretty good Harvard teams. (laughs) And, And he was all right at Ohio State. And, um, He's he's the best like pure scorer on this team and shot creator. Um, I just I just don't love his like efficiency metrics in that area. You know, especially when 
I think you to attack Wagner, you really have to attack them on the inside. You got to cut and slash through their zone and get to the rim. And if that's your one option, I'm not going to take it. One final question. If either of these teams get through, any chance they can hang around for one half against the one seed? I don't think so, just because I think that North Carolina's backcourt, it's just a supernova offensively, right? I mean, R.J. Davis's shot and dribble creation is so dominant, and he could just dribble right through the zone and the press. And Baycott will have a size advantage you know, down low. I I really don't like that matchup in the next round. I'd have to see what the number is. But um, if I had, you know, thinking forward, I'd probably just lay the points. All right, going to the nightcap on Tuesday night, Colorado State laying two and a half against Virginia. The opposite of America's darling. No one wanted Virginia in this tournament, but Tony Bennett, former national champion, brings a team that plays slow, leans on their defense, their seventh and Ken Palm defense to grind out wins. But here's the thing right off the top. The Rams aren't some run and gun team. They're 270th in tempo and they're nearly perfectly balanced. 42nd and 0, 38th and D, according to Ken Palm. Their weakness on defense is their perimeter defense defending the three-point line, which is 191st in the country. Virginia, for all of their issues on the offensive end, they can shoot the three. Outside of that, though, they have real difficulties consistently putting the ball in the basket. 246th in effective field goal percentage. And if you're Colorado State, close out hard on these guys because if you do foul... For whatever reason, this is the worst foul shooting team perhaps in the history of the ACC. Like it knocked them out of the ACC tournament. They shot sub 64% on the season from the line. So if it's a close game, if it's a game in which they put them to the line 20 or 25 times, they're not going to get burned. So I wonder how much that comes into Medved's game plan to just play a little bit more aggressively, at least on the wings, to be able to try to shut down some of that three-point shooting. Then March... As I've said many times, it's all about guard play, and they get the best guard in this game. Isaiah Stevens, incredible point guard for those who haven't watched him. I think he got absolutely robbed that he's not a koozie finalist this year. I think that was pretty incredible given all of his statistical accomplishments. He started 151 games in college. So the the stage, the moments, certainly not going to be too big for him. He's a knockdown shooter, shoots almost 45% from three, 84% from the line. He averaged seven assists per game. He's very low in terms of his turnover rate. And when he has been asked to carry the offense, he has 10 games where he scored 20 plus this year. So I wouldn't necessarily lead with saying that he's a combo guard, but if they need him to play hero ball, he can do it. So of all the mid-major players in the field of 68, he ranks number one in terms of his offensive impact from the box score or the Bayesian performance rating. So that's just something to keep in mind in terms of how much he impacts the game. And then finally, when you start to break down this offense, I know I'm speaking to the Action Network's Mr. X's and O's, so you can, you know, spot check me here. But Medved's system is so fun to watch because it's this blend of Johnny or spread, the B-line's two-guard system, even a version of the Princeton offense, and they will go five out. So even though Virginia is an elite defensive team with one of the best defensive coaches in the history of the sport, there's different ways that they can attack them. And I think they won't necessarily get bogged down if one way of playing isn't working for them. Now, they face four top 40 defenses in the Mountain West Conference this year, including New Mexico and San Diego State, who are both top 25. They get wins over Boise and Nevada and nearly upset New Mexico at the pit. So in terms of being able to break quality defenses and playing well away from Fort Collins, they got it done. So I don't think it's going to be a shock for them to cover this number against Virginia. I understand that the public sentiment has moved off of the Wahoos, and maybe that has inflated this line that should be closer to a coin flip. But even though it's still underneath a single possession, I'll go ahead and take the Rams laying the points. Agree with you 100%. I took the Rams almost immediately when that line dropped. And you mentioned it. They have a few different ways to attack Virginia's pack line. Yeah, they really have two play, two ways. And the first is that you talk about the five out. Um, yeah, Medved runs a lot of that secondary action around the perimeter. So you can actually play you can circumvent the pack line by beating them over the top with those secondary actions. And the second thing is, you know, Virginia is a really good, the pack line is a really good cut denial defense, but if you can dribble penetrate the pack line, their per possession, like cutting defensive numbers are really poor. And so all you need is that, and Colorado state, one of the best cut, rim running cut, cutting offenses in the nation, because you just have Stevens who's an elite passer hitting cutters perfectly in stride every time. So if he can unpack the pack line and then hit cutters, 
you're talking about just inverting Virginia's defense altogether and everything's going to open up. And I mean, in the end, look, Virginia, what, they failed to score 50 points in four of their final five regular season games. All the Rams need to do is generate a few more clutch, good offensive possessions. And I think they, I think they definitely do that. And now it's time for everyone's new favorite part of the podcast, where I tell you that this episode is brought to you by the Spring Cleaning Champions. That's right. It's Manscaped. This season, make sure to groom your carpets and the drapes with the leaders in the below the waist grooming. Clear at that winter bush with Manscaped's Lawnmower 5.0 and watch your confidence bloom like the springtime flowers. Join the 10 million men worldwide who trust Manscaped with our special offer. Go to manscaped.com and use code BBOC for 20% off and free shipping. Manscaped's latest model also features dual LED spotlights to guide you through the darkest winter debris so you can navigate with confidence. And because this bad boy is waterproof, you can shave in the shower, in the bath, or in the ocean if that's what you're into. Get 20% off and free shipping with the code BBOC at manscaped.com. That's 20% off and free shipping with the code BBOC at manscaped.com. Nothing like a little spring cleaning in your pants. All right, back to the play-in in Dayton, going to the next 10v10 in terms of the, I guess, the last teams to make the tournament. It's a little bit shocking when you look at Boise State. You saw their reaction during the, the bracket reveal. You know, they popped off one streamer and didn't move, and it seemed like it was a funeral. Whereas Colorado, I think, you know, when you look at this team, so many squads in the last five to six years have used the playing game as a springboard to making a deep run in the field of 64. Could the Buffaloes do it? I'll tee you up in that way. You are absolutely right. I, Breeze, I think there's a lot to like about Colorado in this tournament. And I guess I'll start here. Um, they slumped mid-season, right? But they dealt with injuries. Cody Williams, Tristan Da Silva, they're fully healthy now. Uh, they have a ton of talent. And they won eight of their final nine games, you know, including a sweet run to the Pac-12, Pac-12 title game. And they probably would have won that game if it weren't for Nafali Dante just going thermonuclear. I think he shot 12 from 12 from the field. Again, there is a lot to like about this team. And the start is that they're really versatile, both ends of the court. Uh, Tad Boyle can run a lot of different sets around KJ Simpson and De Silva, from spread pick and roll to the more typical hybrid Princeton motion. They're also lethal in transition. And Eddie Lampkin is a monster rebounder who often starts that attack by grabbing and going off the boards or finishing it off with a second hand chance bucket on the other end. They are really good at creating open threes and preventing them, ranking top 35 nationally in open three rate and open three rate allowed. But they're still more of like an interior based rim running offense. So I, I like that they can create consistent half court offense at the rim. And thanks to their versatility, you know, they, they run a half decent switch everything defense that's really good on the perimeter. They're good at stopping secondary actions. Plus they never foul and they rebound everything. Now on the Boise State side of things, the Broncos also very versatile squad. Um, Leon Rice tends to prioritize that, but they're in different ways. Um, the Broncos leverage their, their elite positional size to basically just post you up from anywhere on the floor. And then they crash the offensive boards relentlessly, specifically the trio of uh, Tyson Degenhart, Omar Stanley and Cam Martin. That, that's the leader of that team. They can definitely score on post upsets against Colorado, but I'm unsure exactly how successfully they'll be able to do so because, you know, Eddie Lampkin is an above average low block defender. Uh, Javon Hadley is a big guard who can defend um, post upsets pretty much one through five. Same with KJ Simpson. He's got size. De Silva is the one matchup. I, he can really get ex exposed by like elite post creators which is likely the main reason that Colorado's post-up defensive metrics are closer to average than elite. But they also should be able to keep the Broncos off the boards, which is huge against Boise. And I would be surprised if we see Max Rice get hot and deep against Colorado's excellent three-point defense. And on the other end, Boise, same thing. They run a switch-everything defense. But the Broncos are much worse at defending secondary actions. Specifically, their numbers against like cutting and handoff sets are brutal on a per possession basis. They're also they're big across the board, but they are more big in the backcourt and a little bit smaller in the front court. They run like six foot eight and six foot eight. So their their interior defense can get exploited. It is vulnerable. I mean, they allow 1.2 points per shot at the rim. The, around 65% of team around a 65% field goal percentage 
percentage at the rim and 45% in the paint. All of that ranks in the body bottom 20% of division one teams. And that's not good against the buffs, you know, who will run straight downhill on you. Boise is also brutal at defending in transition because they're so reliant on the offensive boards. They don't usually get that back that fast. They were the worst in the mountain West in fast break points per game allowed around 11. Their 1.15 transition points per possession allowed was the 14th worst nationally. So the buffs could, you know, run like hell through this matchup. Colorado is healthy. They're dangerous. They're red hot. And they have some decent matchups to exploit in Dayton. And if they get past Boise, I'm going out on the limb and saying that Colorado can make a real run here between Florida and Marquette's injuries, Texas Tech and Kentucky's high variance offenses and non-existent defenses. I I think Colorado could make make it to the Elite Eight. And I I'm just, I'm on the edge of my seat at, in saying that Texas A and M could pick off Houston in the second round. So all of a sudden, I'm thinking Colorado could make a Final Four. Of course, you know. They haven't they haven't won much on the road this year. They don't have a lot of good wins. I think they have like two Ken, Kenpob top fifty wins, both against Wazoo. But I, I guess I'm ready to get burnt with these buffs. I really love them. All right, we'll go from a team that potentially has Final Four, you know, sleeper potential to two sixteen seeds that are just happy to be here. Grambling State, Montana State. The Bobs are a three and a half point favorite. This game begins and ends with one stat. It's turnovers. Grambling turns it over more than any team in the entire country. 18% of their possessions end with a turnover. And Montana State can turn you over. They force it at the 61st highest clip in the entire country. And the Bobs usually need those extra possessions because they get killed on the glass. They almost never get offensive boards themselves. They're 357th nationally in that regard. And they give up a decent amount of second uh, scoring opportunities. But Grambling is weak on the glass themselves. I don't see this being a situation where they can burn the Bobs in terms of any of their deficiency. And when Montana has the ball, they can attack a pretty decent grambling defense by bombing away from three. You know, the Bobcats shot 36.4% from long range, and the Tigers are a middling perimeter defense. So one final note in in terms of a head-to-head comparison. Montana State, 61st nationally in shooting efficiency. It was enough to get them to the top of the heap in the Big Sky Tournament, grambling 259th. So it's been the case many times between 16 seeds in the play in that it becomes a rock fight. Nobody can put the ball in the basket. I would rather have the team that is a significantly better shooting team with multiple options. I put this spread right on the cusp of two possessions. So I'm snapping up the three and a half here. And I also think it's reasonable to use the minus 165 money line as a sweetener, whether it's with that Colorado play that you just mentioned or stretching it across back to the Tuesday games as well. I think Montana State is a strong play here. They're playing their best basketball. And Grambling, like I said, it's just difficult to sustain anything offensively or put runs together when you're that sloppy with the basketball. So in terms of this SWAC versus Big Sky matchup, I think this is one program in Montana State that's just going to outclass them. What are your thoughts on this one? Certainly lean your way. Um, I'm a little worried. Montana State's interior defense always worries me. But the core has been here and done that before what this is their third straight ncaa appearance i know it's a new head coach but i think some of the main players um but yeah grambling you're right they're sloppy with the ball they're just gonna throw it away and montana state they're gonna just be more steady especially with that core as long as they can you know defend the interior okay i think they'll get through here For Tanner McGrath, I'm Mike Calabrese. This has been the Big Bets on Campus podcast brought to you by BetMGM. Our play-in recap is now in the books, which means our round of 64 breakdown with Stucky, Greg Waddell, Mike Randall, and myself is right around the corner. So be sure to check out your podcast feeds, update them regularly, because we're just going to continue to rain content down on you. We also have live shows coming up on Thursday, Friday, and Saturday to walk you through all of the action to make sure that you're prepared with the latest news, injury updates, line movements, all that good stuff to make sure we keep you in the black this March. All right, that's it for us. Thanks so much for listening.